here. Hello and welcome everyone uh, to the Citizens for Global Solutions Virtual Book Club. I'm Bob Flax, the Executive Director, and today is March 11th, 2023. I'm joined by our book club production team of Gail Hughes, our club coordinator, and Drea Bergman, our programs and campaigns manager. So today is our second session discussing the book, Global Governance and the Emergence of Global Institutions for the 21st Century. We'll be focusing on part two, chapters four through eight, on reforming the central institutions of the United Nations. We're fortunate to have all three authors join us once again, Augusto Lopez Claros, Arthur Lyon Dahl, and Maya Graf, which made for a wonderfully rich conversation last month. So if you weren't here and missed it, the recording is available now on our website under the resources menu, and we'll be posting the recordings for each of the sessions so you could either see them if you missed them or see them again if you'd like. We'll proceed as usual with the authors pointing out the highlights and main ideas from those chapters, and then we'll open it up for questions and discussion. I'm going to ask everybody at this time to go on mute if you're not already on mute and to stay on mute um, you know, when you're not speaking so that we can minimize the echoes, background noise, and all that kind of stuff. Okay? You're welcome to use the chat to communicate with the group, uh, but we will not be monitoring it. So if you have a question that you want to direct to the authors, we'll ask you to raise your hand, actually your cyber hand, um, if you know how to do that. If not, we'll take flesh and blood hands too. Um, so to do that during our question and answer period. Um, we'll stop at about five minutes before the end of the session for any announcements that people might have about relevant events or things that they wanna promote. So I ask you to hold all of those kind of comments until the end. And as usual, if someone shows up in the middle of the session and we don't recognize their name or their phone number or what have you, um, we may stop and ask them to identify themselves so we could prevent hacking, Zoom bombing, and all those other nasty things that happen in cyberspace. So with that, I will introduce our presenting author, um, Augusto, um, sorry, <laughs> Augusto Lopez Claros, um, who will be leading off um, as he is the primary author for the chapters that we will be covering today. So Augusto, you have the floor. Um, thank you, Bob. Um, when, the, when the United Nations came into being, one of the, um, one of the debates that, that was taking place was basically how to organize the, the, you know, the sort of primary institutions, and in particular, the General Assembly. And, and, and Chapter uh, Chapter Four basically is focused on on the General Assembly, and where we proposed a number of uh, a number of uh, you know different reforms. One of the issues was basically that, um, at least in the early thinking, the early part of of the debate that took place about the United Nations was perhaps to create a body that would be a little bit like a like a war legislator, where um, you would give it the ability to pass international law that would be binding on its member countries. And uh, um, unfortunately, that particular vision, as we discussed last time, you know, did not pan out. And eventually what, what they did was to adopt a, a, a system where uh, each country uh, rep being represented in the General Assembly would basically have one vote. Um, so that principle of... Uh, one country, one boat was firmly embedded in the in the in the charter, and I think that one consequence of that was essentially to weaken the General Assembly in, in important ways in, uh, with respect to the to the to the to the Security Council. So, in in Chapter Four, one of the proposals that we make is basically to uh, come up with a formula that would allocate the voting power within the General Assembly in, uh, in respect of some, some objective indicators. You know. And eventually we come up with a, with a proposal where we look at three factors. We look at the relative contribution that each country makes to global 
population. Um, the relative uh, world GDP share, uh, an indication of a country's you know, economic footprint on the global economy. And then we introduce a third factor, which we call a membership share, which is equal for all countries and which has the uh, effect of boosting the voting power of the smaller countries because they get you know, um, one third allocated to them in, in, irrespective of, of the population or, or, the, or the size of the economy. And when you do this, then you come up with a distribution of weights, which seems to be more sensible. Um, you know, looking at the, at the appendix in the book, you see that, for instance, China becomes the largest shareholder in the General Assembly with a voting power of something like 12%. Then the United States comes after that with something like 8.3 and so on down the line. Recently, um, we did an update of these numbers because when the book was published, the latest, uh, the latest data that we had was for 2017. And it's interesting to see what happens if you repeat the exercise uh, using 2021 data, which is the latest that we have now. And if you do that, what happens is that the voting power of countries like India and China and Nigeria goes up and the voting power of countries like Russia and Italy and Japan, whose populations are declining, goes down. And this highlights one interesting feature of our proposal, which is that we, we argue that one could update these voting shares you know, once every 10 years to reflect the structural transformation of the, of the global economy and the world's, the world's population. Um, now, that in itself, it seems like a sensible proposal, but of course it goes accompanied by uh, the idea that once you do that, then you could actually uh, uh, give the General Assembly some additional powers. You know, it would then become the, the, the central uh, uh, institution within the UN system, and then you could give it the ability to to pass some, some, some legislation on you know, peace and security and management of the global commons, the environment. Um, in our proposal, um, the idea is essentially to, to restructure the UN system in a way that much of the authority, um, political authority, and, and also, I guess, moral authority, because the, the, the system now embeds in it you know, a, a, a measure of, you know, population size and the other indicators. And, and, and then the Security Council, to which I will come in a couple of minutes, you know, becomes more like an executive, an executive uh, a council, you know, that has the responsibility for managing the, the UN system, where, but where the political power is actually located in the General Assembly. Now, what's interesting is that there is a precedent for this. Um, you know, you might think, well, that sounds like an interesting proposal, but you know, maybe somewhat, somewhat utopian. The European Union started out in, in the same fashion. You know, back in 1958, the six founding members of the European Union created um, something that was called a Euro European Parliamentary Assembly, and. Uh, uh, initially, it was made up of, uh, you know, 142 parliamentarians from the six, uh, six uh, uh, founding members. Uh, initially, it had largely an advisory role. You know, these parliamentarians were wearing two hats. They were members of their national parliament as well as the European Parliament uh, Parliamentary Assembly. But over time, they realized that, no, what, what we're going to do is we're going to move to a system where we elect these parliamentarians by direct popular vote in their respective countries. And they did this in June of 1979. And today, the European Parliament, as it is now called, has 750 members approximately. It represents 27 countries. And what is significant is that it has acquired um, significant legislative powers uh, over the over the in intervening period. So what started out as a debating uh, uh, sort of club with advisory functions to the to the politicians, in turn has emerged as a very powerful body that passes legislation that is binding on its member countries. And in a sense, you could say that some of the reforms that we have proposed 
um, are inspired by this by this model, you know, which has worked very well for them. Um, it, chapter five puts forward the proposal of creating a world parliamentary assembly as well. You know, at the time that the United Nations was established, there was a kind of a very active debate about possibly creating a second chamber uh, attached to the General Assembly. And we, we think that this would be a very good idea. Um, you know, Albert Einstein at, at the, around that time, actually he wrote a letter to the, an open letter to the General Assembly where he said that the members of the General Assembly should be elected, not, should, should not be diplomats chosen by their respective governments back in their capitals, but, but the credibility of the institution would be enhanced if they were actually elected as, uh, you know, directly by, by, um, by, popular, by, by popular vote. Um, let me just make one more point, and then I'll, you know, I'll pass it on to, to Maya and to Arthur, um, um, and then we can come back to some of the issues and some of the other chapters. I'm especially interested in, in discussing a little bit the issue of the internal health peace force. But in the, in, the, in the proposals that we put forward for reforming the Security Council, not only do we envisage a, a kind of a shift in power from the Security Council to the General Assembly, but we also introduce the concept of uh, basically uh, everybody has a voice in this new council. You know? At the moment, for instance, there is a very interesting proposal being circulated in the UN. It's called the Italian proposal for, for Security Council reform. What the Italians are proposing is essentially to expand the membership of, of the Security Council and to increase the participation of some regions which are not well represented among the 15 members of the Security Council. In particular, they're thinking of Asia and they're thinking of Sub-Saharan Africa. We take a different view. What we do is we say, um, let every country have a voice in the Security Council. In other words, organize the Security Council like the like the governance structure of the World Bank or the IMF, where every, every member has a, has a seat at the table, you cluster them in groups of countries. So for instance, uh, in the case of Latin America, the six countries in the Southern cone of the continent, you know, they get one, one chair in a 24 chair board, but in which every member of the organization has a voice. And we say, let the voice be related to the voting power that, they, that the countries have in the General Assembly. And so we come up with a system which I think is very sensible. You know, it, it, it addresses the issue of legitimacy, which the Security Council at the moment doesn't have because very often you know, important countries are not sitting on it. And it also does away with the veto power in a kind of a very discreet fashion because once you organize the, 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 this, this council in the way that we propose, then no country has a veto in the same way that no country has a veto in the, in the governance structures of the World Bank and, and the IMF. From day one, from 1944, there was never a veto power in these organizations and, it, and they have worked well. And on the veto, although I'm sure Arthur will, will have more to say, I personally think that the veto is largely or gradually going to make its way out, basically because its value it's being de it is, 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 is declining very rapidly. It is, a, it is a, a privilege enjoyed by the permanent members, which, which is, is having less and less operational uh, uh, sort of relevance. And, and a, a, an example of that it is what is happening today with respect to the Russian veto, right? Um, how much is it worth? Very little, because essentially, as soon as they invaded Ukraine, there was an attempt to, for the Security Council to issue a resolution condemning the, 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 the invasion. This was vetoed by the Russians, and that was about it. It went to the General Assembly. Um, the General Assembly, by a vote of 141 uh, uh, countries, uh, condemned the, the, the uh, invasion. But more significantly, because of the Russian veto, essentially the action, the decision-making power was taken out of the UN framework and it was put in the hands of NATO, the European Union and other countries which formed the coalition that is now supporting the Ukraine. So it hasn't protected Russia in any way 
you know, from essentially, you know, facing a very powerful uh, contingent of nations who are going to help Ukraine um, defend itself against this aggression. So um, my guess is that as time goes by, we will see more and more evidence of this, that, that the veto essentially will sideline the organization and the international community in particular situations such as the war in the Ukraine will find alternative ways, you know, to take action. And so the time will come, I think, when countries will realize that the veto, the, 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 the value of the veto has, has, has basically rapidly come down to zero. But that's, that's for, the, for the future. I'll stop here. Thank you, Bob. I think you are muted, Bob. Thank you. Um, so yes, yeah, so we'll open it up to the other authors who either want to comment on that chapter or bring in other information from the other chapters. Uh, Arthur, go right ahead. Well, I think first one, small comment on, on, on chapter four. Uh, you know, we proposed you know, a formula for the General Assembly representation, you know, based on population and GDP and being a state. But one, you know, that's, that's the logical step forward given where we are now. Unfortunately, it also creates, you might say, the wrong incentive to want to increase your economy forever and want to increase your population forever to get more weight in the General Assembly. So at some point in the future, it would be logical to say that that weighting should look more at how sustainable is your community country and how well has it met, met the needs for the well-being of all of its members and therefore create incentives to become as sustainable as possible and to meet the needs of everybody in your country, you know, improve their well-being as far as possible to create, increase your weight in the General Assembly. So this is, a, it's a logical step forward, but it shouldn't be the end of creative thinking on how we might fix the international system. I might say a little more about chapter six, which is the, the next chapter here on the advisory mechanisms to support global policy making. And, you know, there I think is where beyond you might say the role of the legislators themselves in passing legislation. If you're going to have a capacity, say, to pass binding legislation, you also need to make certain that it's, it, it is founded on the very best available information, that the legislators can't do it all by themselves, but they need advisory processes. Part of that is expanding to such things as, as civil society, advising mechanism for civil society, which also can give creative new kinds of thinking and for other kinds of voices that wouldn't necessarily be represented in the, in the elected representatives. But even more important with respect to the, the planetary boundaries, so to speak, and, and the global commons is making certain that there's an adequate scientific advisory capacity. You know, the, the, the science of the global system is very complex. We have a number of advisory processes now for particular parts of it. So we have you know, the, the Framework Commission on Climate Change has the, has the Intergovernmental Panel on, on Climate Change to, to advise it. And we already have working mechanisms where you know, government nominated scientists in their independent capacity provide the best available understanding of the science in a particular area. And this works quite well. And you would see it really it, it gets down to the truth and avoids manipulation and so on. So we know of it, how to do it but it's still within silos. Biodiversity on the one hand, climate change on another, they're now negotiating a new structure you know, on, on pollution and, and, and waste, which where is a gap in the moment in terms of the, the global environmental challenges. So clearly, as we go ahead to build a better UN system, we need to make certain that we can design might say, a set of advisory processes some more specialized with respect to your needs, others looking at the whole picture, how everything fits together in making certain that we also are understanding how the behavior of the whole global ecosystem is functioning and human impacts on it. We also need to look at the, the, you know, the ways in which we're responding to the global human needs. How well are we addressing the extreme inequalities between countries? Do we need to have some better advice as to how to achieve a balancing between those countries with more natural resources and those with fewer resources, but larger human needs. There's a whole set of other areas where some creative thinking from experts in the area could provide a foundation for the, the decisions taken at the legislative level in the General Assembly and at a more political level in the Executive Council to try to implement what is the best for the planet as a whole. 
So that's just some further thinking you know, where we're going as we go through the different elements that need to be done in the book. So I'll, I'll leave it there. So the Great. next question is from the Army Desert Council. Thank yeah. you. Great, thank yeah, you sorry. so much. Yeah, Bob, can you just clarify, are, we're taking all of those four chapters, four to eight at the moment? Yes, so four to eight. Any things that, that oh, uh, you know, yeah, any okay. of the authors want to highlight in those chapters before, before we, we discuss the question? Yeah, yes. yeah. So indeed, uh, Gusto took the lead on the forum five and eight, and Arthur and I worked on the UN Executive Council chapter. And then Arthur, as I recall, you took the lead on the advisory mechanisms chapter, which is great. <laughs> you delved into that really important chapter. So yeah, I can just share a few more comments. Um, so I, I think sort of important and, and, and interesting things from chapter four and five, which I think uh, from our perspective, hopefully helpful is that, you know, it sets out a gradual staged approach for reform of the General Assembly moving to uh, election, full election for by popular vote. And then chapter five, about a world parliamentary assembly, which uh, as many of you may know, there is a very active campaign for, for such a, a facility already with uh, Democracy Without Borders and, and other, uh, some very big NGOs signing onto that. Um, uh, also, you know, we, we talk about a civil society uh, advisory sort of mechanism that could be even set out outside of the UN and, and gradually uh, gain credibility and legitimacy also acknowledging how incredibly important and progressively uh, oriented and, 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 and sort of really, really improving the overall integrity of the UN system and processes civil society engagement already has been and now how commonplace and integrated, even though civil society uh, groups, you know, are, are often disappointed sometimes with, with um, you, you know, the various uh, levels of, of access, but by now it's very commonplace for civil society to be at the table, uh, in, in involved and present in all sorts of various UN processes. So this has been a huge success stories in, in, in so many ways for the UN to date. So just how do we consolidate that progress? Uh, and, and we also talk about, you know, trying to build within these various uh, kind of parliamentary advisory, you know, citizens and citizen groups of the world, how do we build into that um, perspectives on the whole global common good, uh, rather than just focusing on, you know, a nation state's sovereign interest, uh, as in traditional diplomacy, how can the, these be bodies really generative of, of, of some excellent ideas and policies really in, in the whole common good. And that links in with you know, Arthur's comments on these advisory mechanisms, um, um, having really, really good science-based and other technical advice to parliamentarians, and hopefully, you know, looking around the world now at the problems in our, you know, national democracies, even in mature democracies, where there are really um, um, big problems with partisan politics, um, and that's, again, I think we could have gone even further in terms of how do we, you know, sort of um, insulate these bodies or, or make sure these bodies are really next generation, true consultative bodies that don't get bogged down in, in so much partisan politi politics. But I do see, for example, in the functioning of the EU parliament with the, the MEPs uh, there across, even, even though they might be in, in various uh, uh, political parties, there is more of a European consciousness and um, um, there, there's some very positive, powerful dynamics, but how could we even more at the international system make sure that uh, the partisan po politics doesn't dominate and, and, and cripple such international organization uh, 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 bodies among other challenges. For example, we talked uh, in, in terms of our drafting and, and, and writing, um, you know, what should be the criteria to have uh, uh, for, for those to be elected, for example, from, from China, uh, you know, what would happen if, if the proposed members were all from the, the, the central party or, or, you know, countries where there's rampant corruption, should there be a criteria that um, uh, there have to be no, you know, outstanding corruption charges or, or you know, or other criteria. How can, how can we make uh, sure that uh, uh, these, these bodies are really um, uh, 
uh, peopled uh, by representatives who, who are genuinely interested in working in the interests of, of their constituencies, but uh, in the common interests. So I do think these advisory mechanisms that Arthur was describing are incredibly important, including an ethics advisory group uh, or, or, or sort of council, um, which you see already with the UN Secretary General's Our Common Agenda report in terms of you know, the intergenerational ethics. He's really calling for um, you know, the intergenerational justice issues to really be at the forefront of the international community as one big ethical issue in terms of, of climate and ecological crises um, in general. And, uh, but also the, the, the strengths of these advisory mechanisms that are more technical or scientific is again, trying to take it out of, of, of the, the political, the jockeying for self-interest that we too often see in the, the political and cur current diplomatic sort of horse trading and, and some of the unhealthy negotiating, negotiating dynamics. Um, if, if there can be these, these very high quality expert advisory groups, and then as responsible as possible sort of uh, representatives in the legislative uh, bodies and capacities of, of a new system. Um, and so just moving on to the UN Executive Council proposal, you know, what we really wanted to do there was to highlight as clearly as possible you know, and, and, and to telegraph this idea that the UN Security Council as currently constituted does not follow, you know, contemporary standards of governance legitimacy as we would conceive of them commonly in any, almost any jurisdiction, certainly not in any kind of democracy or aspiring democracy. Um, so, and, and, and as many of you may know, the UN Security Council has been the most frequent object of reform proposals over the history of the UN. Um, so, but, but many of these proposals has, have just been sort of adding another, you know, uh, aspiring or, 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 or um, um, country, country from a various region that wants to be the most powerful country in the region. So kind of recreating these dy dynamics of economic and political or military power um, on such, such, a, such a council. And, and some of them have even said, yes, we should also have a veto power. Uh, and the veto power is obviously such a um, uh, deleterious and, 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 and destructive sort of mechanism to, to block uh, proper decision-making. So, so we really wanted to shift the paradigm to say, okay, what, what would an apex executive council look like if we were to take, you know, common now very garden variety principles of governance legitimacy into account, which again is sadly quite novel um, in terms of, of many of, of the reform discourses. Um, and also on the, the, the subject of technical and advisory bodies, we also, uh, suggest some advisory bodies on different areas of, of broad security to advise the, the, this UN, new UN Executive Council, which would have more of a management function. There would be legislative authority of, of a reform General Assembly. Um, but again, trying to take it out of the political and to have really good balanced, diverse, running from, of course, diverse uh, countries, IPC, again, a really good model to start. That could be even strengthened further in, um, across different issue areas. But to depoliticize all of these processes so much more. So, you know, currently on the Security Council, we see such politicized decisions, countries really acting in sort of naked, <laughs> bald sort of uh, power politics sort of impulses on the Security Council with their vetoes or many of their proposals and different things. So how can we, we make the decision-making on you know, the most important uh, executive body in the world so much more neutral based on expert opinions, based on the values and principles of the UN, based on international rule of law, um, and, and again, the well-being of, of all. So those are just a few sort of comments and for the International Peace Force, we haven't really delved into that. And Augusto is the main author, so maybe we can circle back to that chapter a bit later and, and share other comments. Hey, thank you, Maya. And I was actually going to bring that up to see, Augusto, if you want to speak about that right now, because uh, you know, after that, I'll open it up to questions and comments. Just a couple of comments. Um, 
I guess the motivation for this chapter was basically reflecting the kind of concern that was expressed when the UN was created, that if you do not give it the instrumentality um, you know, to deliver on the peace and security mandate, then the United Nations would be largely ineffective. This was a point that was made very eloquently by, uh, for instance, Grenville Clark, by Bertrand Russell, and by Einstein. Um, they all, in some form or other, advocated for the creation of an international peace force that <clears throat> would act on behalf of the international community through the through the UN system. And so, in the in this chapter, we make a, a case for the creation of such a force. You know, Bertrand Russell uh, at, at the time, actually, I think it was in early 1946, he wrote a very fascinating article in a journal called the American Scholar in which he said the following, and I'm paraphrasing, I don't have the precise quote in front of me, but he said that wars will come to an end only and only when the aggressor knows that he will be defeated. Um, it seems such a simple statement, and yet really, if you think about it, it really encapsulates a very powerful truth that, um, you know, it's, it's the notion of, of co collective security, right? An aggressor uh, such as Russia, for instance, today in respect of the Ukraine, has acted in this way because they hope, they think uh, that they will they will succeed, because there is no uh, force on the planet that has the responsibility to to protect a country like the Ukraine, you know, from this kind of uh, from this kind of aggression. So, in the chapter, we actually come up with with. Uh, you know, some fairly um, um, sort of uh, specific ideas as to, as to what are some of the considerations that we would have to, to have in mind at the time that this force was created, you know, how it would be recruited, um, what would be, you know, some of the aspects involved in the administration or the management of this force, how it would be funded, um, you know, issues of logistics, uh, weapons, uh, what would be the action protocol? Uh, you know, what would be the obligations of the countries that are participating in the peace force? Um, the idea is that this would be fully under the jurisdiction of the of the of the United Nations, specifically the General Assembly, and uh, it it would be a multinational force uh, that would act on behalf of you know the, the membership. One issue that we get into, and, and I'll close with this, is the whole sort of economic dimension of the current system. As you know, because there is no collective security, because no country, uh, no institution has the jurisdiction and the responsibility to deliver, deliver security to the UN members, then uh, all 993 members of the United Nations feel that they have to spend to provide for their security. They have to build their armies, their navies, their their uh, you know navies, and and we end up basically overspending. You know, I I come from Latin America. That's my uh, sort of region of origin. And if you look at how much money we have spent in defense in the last, let's say, you know, fifteen years, it comes more than half a trillion dollars. Think of the the uses that could have been made of such vast resources. You know, to improve our infrastructure to uh, improve our our you know systems of public health, our educational systems, where Latin America is falling behind. You know all the indicators that that I have looked at, you know, basically show this emerging gap between Latin America, uh, you know, most of whose countries were actually founding members of the United Nations, and Asia and Central and Eastern Europe and so on and so forth. Right? And I think one one aspect of this is basically the misallocation of resources that comes uh, associated with the current system that we have, which which uh, which uh, you know forces uh, you know more defense spending that is that, that, than is necessary. Um, this is a vitally important issue, especially when you consider you know all the needs that we have at the moment. You know we have to finance a transition to a renewable energy economy, which is going to cost trillions of dollars. Um, during COVID uh, in 2020, 2021, we discovered that our public health systems are totally unprepared for an event of this nature, such as a global pandemic. We know that there will be more pandemics coming in the future. Um, 
we we have huge uh, huge uh, unmet needs in the area of poverty alleviation. We have 800 million people who are uh, malnourished. We have 700 million people who are still illiterate in the in the 21st century. I mean, when you just look at the at the economic and social agenda that we have in front of us, you know, um, you can make a very very you know, powerful case for coming up with a system, you know, where security is provided in a more sensible, more intelligent way. And and this chapter is intended to sort of start the debate in that in that in that direction. Um, I'll stop here. Okay. Thank you so much. Any other comments from the authors before I turn it over to the group? No, author. Okay, terrific. Well, then I'll I'll turn to the group for questions and comments. Um, let me first point out that uh, for those of you who don't have your chat open, um, Drea has been posting in the chat some links to some of the topics that our authors have been talking about. So if you want to, you can check the chat and see that. Um, as far as the questions are concerned, I once again want to remind people to be as brief as possible so that um, as many people as can, as want to can ask questions. Um, if you know how to do it, please raise your cyber hand. I will go through those first, and then I'll take the flesh and blood hands. Um, and please keep your questions to chapters four through eight. Um, we will be covering other topics uh, in the months to come. So with that, I will call on Gail first. Hi, um, I'm with the um, Minnesota chapter of CGS and Joe Schwartzberg was a towering figure in our organization. Um, I gathered that basically you've adopted Joe's um, plans from his, he wrote a book, of course, um, very, with very detailed uh, suggestions. And it, it seems to me, um, okay, you've updated the data as far as the three um, factors involved in the, the weighted voting. And um, I'm wondering if you could just kind of um, delineate what things you change besides that. And um, I also have a comment about most conflicts over the past half century have been largely internal in nature. Um, that seems to be in conflict with our underlying assumption that if we have a world federation that will eliminate war because we don't have war within the US after having changed from a, a confederation to a federation I'm wondering if you could comment on that also. Great. Thank you, Gail. Any of the authors want to jump in? Just have to take let yourself off. Yeah. yeah. Let me just comment briefly. Um, you know, in our book, we we are very explicit in recognizing the the proposal made by uh, Mr. Schwarzberg. Uh, and in fact, in the in the in the proposal, we call it a modified Schwarzberg uh, proposal, right? And it's modified in the following sense: um, in the in the GDP metric, um, we do something which he didn't do, which is basically to um, take a composite of GDP at market prices and uh, GDP at purchasing power parity, and take a weighted average of that uh, as a way of coming up with a metric of economic size that I think is, is uh, you know, more, more accurate in some sense or more, more, more sophisticated. Um, but, but the other two sides, you know, the, the, the other two variables, the population, relative population size and the membership, mem membership uh, 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 share are, are the same. Right. So that's why we call it a modified proposal, because, because we do introduce this, uh, this uh, uh, change in the methodology in, in the way which calculate GDP. And then you're right. Yes, we also update the, the data on, uh, uh, that, that, that was used by him inevitably. And, and as I said, um, I have just recently, literally a couple of days ago, run up uh, an update of our own data, which was published in the book. Um, using 2021 data, just to see, you know, what, what, you know, in what way would the, would the shares change? In the book, um, the idea is to update uh, 
this this these numbers, you know, like once a decade using you know sort of uh, internationally accepted data to reflect changes in the structure of, of, of the population. I am sensitive to Arthur's point uh, about the, the sort of limitations of using something like GDP in the calculation of voting shares. Um, and uh, I think that in the book, we do highlight that in the future, when we have more um, sophisticated data for all UN members, you know, that would capture aspects of sustainability and so on, then we could revise the formula. We could come up with something that perhaps was more sustain, more, 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 more sensible, and that would not create some of the some of the you know perverse incentives that that Arthur mentions, and which we explicitly rec rec recognize in the book. I think that that is a good point. And then um, on the on the second point, um, you know, I am I am uh, very much uh, of the view. Uh, put forward by Michael Mandelbaum, who some 20 years ago wrote a very interesting article where he said that major war uh, of the kind of war that we saw, you know, World War II, World War I, you know, uh, in international in nature involving a large number of countries, he said that that would gradually become obsolete. It would, it, it would, it would basically uh, not happen because he argued that costs associated with that kind of conflict had risen um, many, many fold since, uh, since World War II um, because of integration, because of interdependence. Uh, you know, think, think the costs that would come as a result of a war between the United States and, and, and China today, you know, two economies that are, um, you know, extremely integrated um, in, in, in every, every aspect, you know, the trade between these two nations is, is huge, is the largest, the largest bilateral trade flow in, in the world. So, so a, a, a war, you know, between uh, these two economies would be, would be devastating for, 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 for both of them, right? And then, of course, he also, Mandelbaum also made a point, which I think is a valid one, and we see this in, in Russia today, which is basically that there is a great deal less tolerance for the kind of killing and and uh, and maiming that we are seeing in the Ukraine and that we saw, of course, in World War One and World War Two, the feelings of patriotism, which very often were were uh, a, a, a very important component of of these wars, have been replaced. He says, and I, I agree, by a feeling that. But war is largely a criminal enterprise, and those are the perceptions of, of people. And so, for that reason, he would think he thought that, and he argued that we would gradually move to a world in which we could continue to have intrastate conflicts, you know, ethnic conflicts between ethnic groups and re religious groups, and so on. But that the kind of war that we saw last in World War II would gradually phase out. Thank you so much. Do either of the other authors want to add to that? Yes, Maya? Just uh, ask Gail for some clarification. Sorry, could you clarify your second question? Oh, well, on page um, 161 in chapter uh -huh. eight, um, toward the bottom. Yeah, you don't need to quote the page number, but you there was something about the internal, but what was your question? It's a most question. conflicts over the past half century yeah, have largely yeah. been. But what was your question in related to? Oh, in relation the to question it? is well, there has, there seems to be an assumption that if we have a world federation, um, that will eliminate war because, um, in opposition to um, when you have individual countries or confederations, uh, those countries that have merged, like the European Union and the US versus uh, the US um, at present versus the US Confederacy war did not occur after those unions. So we figured that the similar phenomenon would happen if the whole world became one federation, there wouldn't be any, it, any more war. But what is your question? If we agree with well, that or? Yeah. It, yeah, it seems that, that um, the fact that the most present um, conflicts are internal would challenge that assumption. So I'm wondering about your comment on that. 
Oh, I mean, we still see some interstate wars, obviously, uh, um, Russian Ukrainian invasion of Ukraine case in point and, and other other uh, issues. But but I think the point that different um, scholars and social scientists have been made, made, like tracking the data for the adoption of the charter, is that this has led, seemed to have led, I don't know if they've, you know, studied <laughs> causation, but um, uh, there's, there, there has been um, um, a decrease in interstate uh, wars since the adoption of the charter in 1945. Uh, so, so, but, but one can can see the 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 charter is a start at political uh, unification or political uh, integration of the nations of the world in some in some kind. It's it's a it's a preeminent in, uh, instrument that dominates over other all other international legal instruments. Um, and and sets out very clear norms and a collective security mechanism, even though it's 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 a weak uh, a collective, relatively weak collective security mechanism. So we see already, you know, uh, you know how one defines confederation versus federation and and the transition between the two. Uh, you know, you could define those, but but the charter is is a start towards a collective security system, obviously, and and also um, political uh, unification of, of, of states, the United Nations. Um, so you can see those tendencies and effects on interstate uh, conflicts. I mean, that's the, the argument I've seen from, from scholars and the social science evidence. Um, and yeah, just one author I, I find very interest, interesting uh, is a social anthropologist called Douglas Fry. Who've studied, who's, who has studied or delineated the key attributes of so-called peace systems. Um, and he, he indeed, he doesn't say it's because they're federated or not. Uh, he looks at you know, five sort of practical attributes, five or six practical attributes in these different um, uh, 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 conglomerations or associations of various different subunits. And he, he crosses cultures. He, he, the EU is, is one of these examples. But for example, one of the features is supranational dispute resolution institutions. Another is, you know, a culture or, or like a like symbols and, and culture and rituals of, of non-warring values and peace. Uh, so that's also very interesting work, I would say, in terms of where we're at as an international society and where we need to get to to kind of to to ensure really a durable peace. Great, thank you, Maya. And we do need to move on if we're going to get everyone in. But author, I see your hand up. Go right ahead. I was just thinking, with respect to the, the international conflicts, many of those, are, of course, are proxies for various outside pressures. You know, and once you have a better global governance system, and you and and the nation state is less important, there wouldn't be the same incentives. At the same time, when you have a system that is focusing on on human rights and reducing inequalities, many of the causes of conflict within states from poor governance or your know, domination and so on would also the, the drivers would gradually diminish so i think there'd be very few many fewer reasons to to see that kind of conflict, even within a state you know, going, going ahead and in the places where they are one could easily see the rest of the world concerned what could they do to help to negotiate you know help the, the resolve his internal conflicts you know are there tools like you know ways they could assist to resolve it in a more, more peaceful way. So I think you, know, you improve the global governance and it would also have us spill down to other levels and improve governance at other levels as well. Great, thank you, Arthur. Let's move on to Ted and Simon. I'll just say that I did see your flesh and blood hand up there. So I'll put you in line before me. So we'll, we'll, we will get to you. So Ted, take it away. Hello, Arthur, Maya, Augusto. It's, uh, it is great to experience your erudition uh, here on Zoom, as I have myself many times in the past three years, I guess, since the Zoom era. Uh, so thanks for so much for joining us. Uh, I'm so glad that Gail Hughes uh, brought up uh, Joe Schwartzberg, uh, and I'm so glad that you guys, uh, as, as I have known in the past, are deeply familiar with that proposal. Um, I, I, I want to ask you about another earlier weighted voting proposal uh, by a man named Richard Hudson, who created, boy, it must be 30 or 40 years ago now, uh, I think it was the 80s, uh, something called the Binding Triad Weighted Voting System. It was not dissimilar to yours. It, 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 the three components were one state, one vote, uh, population, 
and economic strength. Can you guys hear me? It looks like my screen is freezing. Yes, or something. The, the sound is fine. That's that funny. Yeah, let me. I'm not sure what happening. that was. Yeah. yeah. So Hudson's Hudson scheme had uh, one nation, one vote, population and economic strength. But I think if I'm remembering right, he had this this brilliant, I thought, idea, which is we're not going to measure just economic strength. We're going to measure contributions to the United Nations system and other common transnational purposes, um, which is a brilliant idea, I think, because it obviously gives an incentive to company to countries to give more than their the percentages uh, might might ask. And conversely, if there's countries with a great deal of economic strength that aren't ponying up, and my country, the United States, has done that many times in the past 78 years, most famously during the Jesse Helms era, then, th then you lose some of your voice and vote at the United Nations. What do you all think of that idea? Thanks, you guys. Okay. Anyone want to jump in? Um, you know, later, I guess next month or the month after that, we'll come to the chapter on UN funding. You know, we do have a specific proposals on how to fund the UN system, um, and uh, which, which I guess are are echoing the, the 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 principle that you have you have uh, laid out, Ted, which is that you know countries, uh, the bigger countries, with uh, 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 more heft in the in the global economy, should make more of a more of a contribution to the to the to the UN budget. Um, we did not enter uh, into trying to link up the voting power and the and the general assembly, you know, to uh, a country's a country's contribution to the to to the to the budget. Right? We we dealt with budgetary issues as a self-standing issue. How can we uh, uh, come up with a system that is fair, that is equitable? That is a, a, a binding obligation of UN membership, uh, and at the same time delivers to the United Nations resources that are, you know, well beyond what the UN has at the moment, which is not not very much. Right? But I hesitate to say more because because I think that will come later in a, in a future discussion when we deal with that chapter. Great, thank you. Do either of the other authors want to make a comment on that? N not at this time. Okay. Joseph. Uh, well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to ask uh, Meyer Groff a question about international law. Uh, the, um, the treaties that ended the Cold War, especially the, Internet, the uh, Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, the Conventional Forces in Europe Treaty, and just last month, the uh, Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty have all been repudiated. Um, also, the uh, the comprehensive test ban has gotten stuck, uh, still missing uh, all the nuclear powers. And the recent uh, Treaty for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons has drawn only 68 parties. Uh, the Outer Space Treaty of 1967 seems to have been uh, repudiated by the United States' creation of a outer space force uh, complementing the Army, Navy, and Air Force. Uh, has not international law declined so far that uh, the Cold War is uh, perfectly uh, without restraint and could easily come, come back? Thank you, Joseph. Yeah, I mean, I think one point about international law, sadly, is that it's always been very fragile and it's always been uh, contested across a whole wide range of areas. And even, you know, when I went to law school about uh, 20 years ago or so, um, you know, there's still debates about is international law law, true true <laughs> law as we speak about in domestic jurisdiction or as, as law is commonly conceived. Um, and because of sort of the, the movements of, of civil society um, uh, and, and, and these recent dramatic campaigns, for example, with the International Criminal Court campaign and, and, and otherwise, 
and and then just international society needing uh, uh, regulation and solving problems across a wide range of areas, international law has matured uh, more, I would say, even the last couple of decades, just, just as a general body of, of law, um, uh, also supported by developments in the European Union, which has, again, had this progressive development um, and you know greater and greater seriousness of of EU um, you know legal regulation with direct effect across so many countries within the EU and and supranational effect also uh, which has been very powerful. So, with respect to these um, uh, various arms related uh, treaties, um, you know there was there was some, as you mentioned, remarkable progress after the end of, of the Cold War. And that's basically because of, of some, some leadership in, in, in you know, two states in particular. Um, and so very susceptible to changing trends in those two individual states. So, so all obvious, always like a very fragile and incomplete area of, of um, international law. Um, and you, do, I mean, it's, it's not, you know, and again, dependent on two major states, which is the problem we have with the Security Council too, is so dependent on the countries with the veto power. Mm -hmm. So in, we'll get to our, our chapter on disarmament, but again, we try to take the perspective, okay, what would a genuinely rational, effective collective uh, system for you know really effective international disarmament policy, monitoring regulation, what would that look like rather than this fragmented and ad, ad hoc. So all these treaties that you mentioned, um, again, so so fragile, ad, ad hoc, um, extremely admirable, important, and also for those political leaders who who pioneered them um, and had the vision. But then when the the you know there's degenerating um, national uh, problems as we had in the US under the last administration in particular, we have currently um, in, in Russia, then the whole international community is threatened. You know, we all suffer. We don't have a genuine sort of disarmament uh, legal framework. So I, anyways, I'll, I'll stop there, but just generally there's there's fragility within, again, our international legal system and generally and in the ad hoc approaches we've, we've taken that leaves so much to simple consent and individual willingness of states that can go in and out of these legal regimes, you know, at a drop of a hat or, you know, in the case of the, the International Criminal Court, like, okay, there's a year lag, you know, so um, the way that our international legal system is designed is very volatile and it's, it's not secure in terms of delivering those various global public goods that, that we need. Thank you, Maya. Do either of the other authors want to comment? Okay, hearing none. Um, let's go to David. Oh. Um, first, I just want to remind everyone that Schwarzberg also had a, a way in which to change his formula over the years simply by adding uh, a multiple to the population factor in the uh, numerator by, you could call it 2p, two times population, and then you change the denominator to five, or you could change, you could multiply the population by three and then change the numerator to six. So because of the formula, you can you can change those variables and those numbers. Um, but my question then is on the chapter about the International Peace Force. Because as I read it, I got the impression that you're proposing um, a system where there would be voluntary UN soldiers versus what a world federalist have emphasized which is world policemen, where the purpose would be to arrest individuals who violate world law, rather than the proposal that I think you're talking about of having soldiers who would uh, be able to actually come and con combat and contact with national soldiers. So I think that's a, a very different way, uh, two different ways of even approaching the whole question of enforce, enforcing world law. So um, the question is, is how you intend to keep the peace through an international peace force? Is it through fighting or is it through arresting? Thank you. Anyone wanna take that? Yeah. Um, you know, the, the 
the idea of the International Peace Force is that it basically it provides a deterrence, right? It is, uh, in, in an ideal world, the Peace Force would actually never be utilized. It would be there to take action if needed, but if it was well enough endowed with resources, if it was large enough, mm. and if in parallel to the establishment of the Peace Force, we had seen a process of disarmament, uh, which uh, is one of the future chapters, then um, you know that there, we might we might be in a situation where where the, the international peace force you know is essentially playing the role of a powerful deterrent to prevent countries from wishing to you know break international law, uh, invade a, a neighbor or or do do, do other things right. Um, the use of the peace force, in other words, would be a last recourse. Um, it would be used uh, only in those circumstances in which negotiations, sanctions, you know, and other instruments have failed, and then it becomes necessary to intervene in a in a military way to whatever you know, reverse an invasion or you know, protect uh, protect uh, po populations from massive violations of human rights and so on and so forth. Right? And, and so, yes, at some point, um, it is possible that there would be a confrontation between the peace force on the one hand and the national uh, forces of the, of the aggressor on, on the other. That is envisaged. And for that reason, uh, as we lay, lay out in the chapter, you know, we enumerate a number of action protocols and circumstances under which that action would actually take place, right? Um, I don't want to speak on behalf of uh, Maya and Arthur, but I think I know them well enough to say that, and, and they can certainly correct me, we are not pacifists. Uh, I think in the book, we explicitly state that we believe that forced used to promote justice is acceptable, is acceptable, and that we should we should be prepared, you know, to to um, uh, add some some muscle uh, and to act in in ways that might lead to fatalities uh, in, in the event of a recalcitrant uh, aggressor who did not wish to listen to 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 um, you know the voice of the international community as expressed by by the by the by the united nations that uh, that stands behind the peace force right. thank you do our other authors want to add anything to that yeah go ahead maya yeah just um to to sort of respond and say i do think you know the paradigm of an international policing force is is a correct paradigm and you know what we see in in national military protocols, even those that are um, engaged in some international operations and you know peacekeeping, like the protocols haven't shifted um, uh, to um, the new demands of an international society to to international law. Like many of the the, the current militaries are. are Oh, Arthur, everyone, I think you're... Everyone make sure they're on mute, please. World law. Uh, okay, are you there? Arthur Canigas? Okay, oh, I'm here. Go ahead. Yeah, so so, so, um, so just to say, like, I, I think we need to go through many, many more paradigm shifts and refinements of our thinking. And, you know, it, you know it's like with also with the National Police Force, Police have the the option to use force in certain circumstances, as Augusto was saying, but that's to to enforce the law, to protect you know the innocent, and to to you know resolve situations that are publicly dangerous. Um, so I mean, I guess my point is this chapter was just a start <laughs> in terms of of discussing these issues um, and and figuring out you know. Really, at the international level, what the what the correct paradigms and and there there's a whole lot of transformations that need to to happen. You know, currently at the national level, but then any kind of military uh, uh, capacity at the international level, there has to be a careful, careful rethinking about all of the different you know approaches, protocols, and and in 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 very clear um, harmony with international rule of law, international public good, 
with you know safeguards, checks and balances, uh, independent expert advisory uh, sort of mechanisms and facilities to make sure you know there there are many many safeguards. And again, with this you know sort of democratic legitimate governance kind of protections for for such a facility a facility at the at the international level. So just to um, sort of agree with David, if you're you know talking about this police this police model. Um, uh, which I think is is a good good way of thinking about where we need to get to at the international level, uh, rather than having a vol volatile international systems uh, or international conditions where there might be, you know, having to have this terrible option as we see in Ukraine Russia uh, confrontation of just you know the the terrible reality of of, of such armed conflict is something we would want to avoid at, at all costs, of course. Thank you. Um, so Simon, you had your hand up earlier. Why don't you go ahead? Wonderful uh, book and uh, advice and uh, advance uh, from the past. But as we know, we've been uh, moving slowly forward for the last uh, 70 plus years, uh, trying to get this kind of better world. Uh, which uh, we are still struggling in achieving. The questions I have runs to the basics, really. Do we have individual education and training and expertise, individual person in the world today, to be uh, thinking about becoming an expert in, in, the, in the field of, let's say, leadership, a uh, coachership, coaching, training, teaching, making uh, their uh, uh, students experts, uh, and then uh, training themselves and others in terms of win-win uh, interdependence. If I win, you win because we are interdependent. If I if I if I win, you lose. Then we begin to have a war. So we have to think and, and practice and put into place the win-win as individuals. Uh, and uh, we have to uh, make sure uh, that is the case always. And uh, once we have individuals who believe in nonviolence uh, to win-win everyone, not lose-lose or win-lose, as is the case today so much in the approaches that Russia uses because the, the leadership don't have any training in the aspects we just uh, discussed. And until that is in place by for individuals in families, in countries, that we have leaders who think this way, are we ever going to have you know, a world federation with win-win interdependence? That's my question. Okay, thank you, Simon. Although that is outside of the chapters we uh, for the reading today, do any of our authors want to speak to that? Yes, author. So the chapters 19 and 20 do address issues of education and issues of the kind of training we need to be to be an international civil servant to serve in such an organization. So yes, that change in basic values is a critical part of it. I just will also flag very briefly the Intergovernmental Science Policy Panel on Biodiversity Ecosystem Services, which advises the Biodiversity Convention, is presently preparing a whole scientifically based report on transformative change. How do you change the fundamentals of a system rapidly to achieve the goals that we need to achieve? And in looking at issues of values, issues of, of different worldviews. And so, so this will be coming up in another year or so. I'm just Hoping to review the first draft of the report. It's quite exciting in terms of creative thinking about what we have to change at the human level in order to bring about the changes in the system. Thank you. Thank you. Any comments from our other authors? Okay, so as president, as the senior president Bush said, stay tuned. We, we will get there. Okay, so, um, so before I ask my question, I just want to point out since Joe Schwartzberg was mentioned several times, that it was actually Joe's book that started this book club five years ago. Um, so just to remind people that we actually read through it, which kicked off the book club. 
So my question is that I'm currently teaching a course in global governance and world federation. And for whatever reason, I'm really surprised to see that most of the students in that core in this class are indigenous persons. And whenever I talk about global governance and world federation, they get very upset, um, which is every, every class. <laughs> so the, the issue that they raise is that, um, you know, that, th that their groups and other marginalized groups are so marginalized that they're afraid that if there are global elections for representatives to a world parliament, whatever, they will even be more marginalized. The trauma will be re-traumatizing. So the question I have and kind of is asking on their behalf is what, um, what do you envision as safeguards and guarantees that the voices of more marginalized groups do get carried up to the global level and are represented there? Thank you. And whoever wants to jump in can jump in. Yeah, go ahead, Arthur. Well, thank you. I've actually, I worked a lot with indigenous peoples and marginalized groups when I was the advisor of the Pacific Island countries for more than a decade and built a regional environmental program of all of those countries. Uh, and I think the, the, the point here is that with the change to, you know, the, we're no longer looking at, you might say, power dynamics in the same sense. We're looking at systems that appreciate the diversity that, that comes from all the different marginalized groups that needs to be included. Listen to because they have much to say. Already, we said that with respect to biodiversity, they're much better managers of biodiversity than modern scientists and then the Western system and so on. And you know, so we you have still these colonial systems exploiting things around the world, pushed by the West. So I can understand their sensitivity and their fear, because that's what's always happened to them. You know, they've been crushed every time by these big powers from outside. So you need not only you know, you need to have a system that acknowledges that you need to get away from that the kind of power dynamics in the present system to one that is much more you know saying where where is the the truth of multiple perspectives and multiple sets of values which is why you need the civil society voices why you need the scientific voices why you need people and I think Washington Convention is going much further at putting a, they need to be at the table very explicitly and listening to them and considering everything they do within the framework of those multiple sets of worldviews and value systems and appreciating them and seeing their need to be included. So it's already happening in one area at least, and we can spread that to others as well. Great, thank you. Any other comments from our other authors? Okay, seeing none. Um, oh, go, go ahead, Maya. Okay, just just to 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 make the the comment I made earlier that 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 in my mind should be another layer of of refinement and reflection in terms of these uh, legislative uh, bodies and and capacities. You know, what about uh, gender quotas and and gender also to to make sure there's gender balance in 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 such bodies um, and then indeed indigenous persons and minorities. And there's, of course, been a lot of work at the international level on these issues. So how, again, how could we make the next generation like parliamentary or legislative uh, bodies um, in the international system that could be really vibrant and, and, and just very, very rich? Also, as Arthur was mentioning, this, 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 the profound insight that comes with diversity, with indigenous uh, persons and, and otherwise to make sure all of humanity and, and then particularly you know, different oppressed or prejudiced groups like women uh, and others, different racial groups, ethnic minorities would be properly represented. I think that would be part of the process um, of, of making sure these were, were very um, next generation uh, bodies. Right. Thank you so much. Okay, just to remind everyone, we have a little more than uh, 10 minutes left um, till we get to the announcements and close. So with that, I'll turn to Brad. Hello, my question is for Dr. Lopez Claros. I watched really with interest your speech at the International Conference of Chief Justices of the World at the City Montessori School last year. And I was wondering, what is your opinion of what Dr. Jagdish Gandhi has been uh, doing there in India for so many years? As you know, he's a strong supporter of the Constitution for the Federation of Earth. Do you endorse the Earth Constitution? Is it an idea whose time has come? Or is it still too radical 
for the near future? You know, um, all of these are very valuable initiatives in the sense that they, you know, try to push the envelope out uh, and to force us to think of, you know, better ways to, to uh, sort of collaborate internationally across borders. My own preference, and I speak here, uh, you know, for myself, would basically be to uh, start with the UN Charter and ask ourselves, you know, what are the changes that need to be made in order to bring the UN Charter into the 21st century, um, to empower their organization to become a problem-solving organization, um, able to come up with uh, intelligent practical solutions to the multiple problems that we face today, from climate change to you know, the unraveling of our nuclear order to uh, poverty and, and, and inequality and, and, and so on. And the UN Charter, when it was adopted, was a very important step uh, forward. It was, uh, uh, you know, with all its limitations, you know, it was uh, an important initiative, you know, to help us address these these global problems. So my own preference would be to go back to that document and to to rethink it, um, uh, you know, in light of today's today's challenge. Thank you. Do uh, either other authors want to comment? Seeing none. Okay. Um, uh, David. Yes. Yeah, so uh, this is a follow up to Dave Otten's question about the, the UN having a, a military style sort of might makes right um, deterrent force rather than a uh, peace or police force. I know. Uh, my, you said that that would you know be a, maybe a future option, but I, I guess I'm wondering why, as, as authors, you chose to to choose to talk about a, a military style force with that would have weapons um, rather than like a police force that that would show that we could interact under law without having to have weapons. Um, you know that the proposal for the creation of an international peace force is, is uh, tied very closely in our book to the next chapter, which falls outside of today's discussion, which has to do with disarmament. In other words, we see two parallel process, processes taking place simultaneously. Um, one involving the setting up of the force, which we would see as a last recourse, as I indicated uh, before, but which would be endowed with the capacity, you know, to to act uh, with with uh, with uh, you know effectiveness. But there is in parallel a process of disarmament, which uh, unfortunately we're not doing very much on. You know, I I remind you, Article Six of the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons is specifically called for uh, uh, a process of disarmament involved, you know, in respect of nuclear weapons. We are going in exactly the opposite direction. Last year, according to Jody Williams, who, who knows about these things, uh, the nuclear powers spent $82 billion you know, modernizing their arsenals and adding to them, right? which is contrary to the letter and the spirit of the NPT treaty. Right? So we need to get away from that, that dynamic. We need to enter into a process of disarmament and when you see these two processes as taking place simultaneously, then, then you know, one can envisage a time in the future when in fact, it will not be necessary to use the peace force in a, in a, lethal, in a lethal sort of way, because no country will have the military that will be powerful enough to meet and to challenge the, the, the peace force, right? And, and so in, in an ideal world, it would actually never be used, but it would be there just in case, you know, as a precautionary institution. Thank you. Do uh, either other authors want to comment? Okay, seeing none, it looks like author, you might have the last question. Go right ahead. You need to go off mute. Yes, there we go. Uh, so I hope so. And now in the chapter, in the uh, chapter about the World Parliament, uh, you talk about how uh, 150 organizations, the European Parliament, the Pan African Group, of thousands of parliamentarians have all called for this. And uh, you know, for as been pointed out, for 70 years we've been been calling on the nation states to do this. 
And I'd like, I guess, uh, Maja specific, specifically to talk about what do you see as the prospects that, you know, that we the people can just go ahead and create uh, such a world parliament, let the UN come along later and join it. And, and so two parts are, how could this, you know, be initiated directly from civil society and, and start without the nations joining? And secondly, how could it have a greater component of, 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 of not only involving civil society organizations, but involving uh, people in debates across the directly involved in conversations across the borders, the, uh, the divisions, uh, to come to kind of a consensus of what is the will of the people of the world. Um, can you give a little comment about, about that? Uh, obviously Great. based on Gary Davis's uh, input. All right, thank you, author. Anyone wanna jump in on that? Just yeah, very sure. briefly. Yeah. So, sorry, Maya, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. Um, yeah, sorry, uh, Arthur, you were, you were saying what is the, I think that's a really interesting, it's a wonderful idea, actually, for, for civil society around the world to, to create such a forum um, around key global issues, global risks. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful idea, brilliant, and I think it would, it would get a lot of support and, and a lot of uh, buy-in, you know, something separate from all of the civil society engagement with all the various UN processes, but really its own kind of dynamic body. But of course, you would need funding for that. And you would need, you know, organizations that would have the vision to really think in that way. There aren't many civil society organizations still that really think about, you know, global sort of citizen assembly broadly conceived for the whole range of, of, of global issues, global risks. Um, However, like in the climate space at COP26, I'm not sure if they were also present at COP27, there was a citizens assembly on climate uh, that was a, an experiment that was very well received. They didn't have so much impact, I would say, but at least it was like this affirmation of, of international um, uh, citizen voices and, and, and the, the need um, and hunger for these kind of assemblies. Um, but optimally, there should be some kind of smart coalition, civil society organizations and like-minded uh, states working towards some kind of body like that at the international level. I think the time has more than come. Um, but then again, yeah, you need a very well-organized sort of campaign and, and resourcing for it. Thank you. Arthur? I'm sorry, uh, a little footnote, yeah. A yeah. little footnote to, to Maya's comment. You know, in the year 2000, uh, Kofi Annan, the Secretary General, actually invited 1,500 representatives from civil society organizations to come and participate in something that was called the NGO Forum. Um, these were uh, people who came representing you know, particular strands of thought or causes, environment, uh, human rights, uh, gender equality, uh, and so on, uh, not representing their, their, their you know, uh, countries. And, uh, in the book, we 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 endorse this this uh, we mention this as a, as a very interesting way to empower civil society because these organizations, after meeting in New York in May of 2000 for, for a couple of weeks, drew up recommendations for the September meeting of heads of state, which at that time was the largest ever uh, congregation heads of state. There is no reason why this 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 gathering could not be formalized in some way. Maybe uh, you sh we should have an NGO forum every five years and, and you know, provide this vehicle you know, for the expression of very important views on the part of civil society, which then have an input into the decision-making um, processes within, within the UN. So uh, unfortunately, you know, that was a one-time initiative. It has never happened again, and it's regrettable because it was, it was actually an excellent opportunity to empower civil society and to give it a voice in many of these global global challenges and, and, and problems we face. Great, thank you. Um, we are coming to the end of our time. Uh, before we move to announcements, I want to just give the uh, our authors a chance if there's anything they want to say as concluding comments for these chapters. You don't have to, but if there is any closing comments, yes, author. But just following on from, from there is in fact a global futures forum organized by civil society taking place later this month uh, in to provide inputs to the summits taking place in september and the summit on the future next year so there's been a whole civil society process with lots of 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 different groups thinking up 
what kind of a people's declaration should be presented to the governments. So it's not as formal as what took place in New York, but there are quite significant mechanisms taken, providing the civil side of voices in the process going forward this year and next. So that's that's an encouraging step forward. Thank you. Great. And I just you. put the link in the in the chat. Terrific. Thank you. Okay, so um, I'll at this time I'll change gears over to our closing announcements. So before I ask uh, Gail to tell us our, our next meeting date, um, or do any folks have anything that they wanted to announce, uh, a, a book they're writing that's coming out, an event that they're doing, anything of that sort? Now is the time. Going once, going to David. We don't hear you. You're on mute. You're still on mute. On May 7th, the uh, St. Louis chapter of CGS will uh, hold its annual meeting, and we will have a uh, a talk by Larry Whitner on uh, on disarmament, nuclear disarmament. Terrific. Thank you. Uh, Drea, and you're on mute. Thank you. Sorry. Can you hear me okay? Because I'm having yep, internet yep. issues. Hear you fine. Great. Thank you. Uh, CGS is going to have an event on April 22nd uh, with author Zam Samuel Zip, and he'll lead us in a Q&A on Wendell Wilkie's One World, and I'll put the link to the registration on the chat. Great. Thank you, Drea. Any other announcements? Okay, well, let me turn to Gail. Um, when are we meeting next? We're meeting, as usual, on the second Saturday of the month. In April, in April's the next month, and so it will be April 8 at the usual time from noon to 1.30, your, um, noon to 1.30 Eastern time. And we will be focusing on the last half of part two of the book. Those would be chapters nine through 12, pages 181 to 290. And of course, I'll send you a message about that. But if you just remember the last half of part two, we've addressed the first half of part two this round. And so that's the next the next um, area of focus. Great, thank you, Gail. So at this time, uh, I wanna thank you. Oh, disarmament, sorry. international rule of law, human rights and funding. Those Great, are the thank chapters. you. Great. So at this time, I want to thank everyone for attending and especially thank our authors for their wonderful sharing uh, and all the information that they've, they have shared with us. Um, I want to invite the authors, if you want to stay another moment or two, uh, our production crew does a debriefing. If there's anything you want to let us know about any ways we can improve this or, you know, what worked, what didn't work, et cetera, et cetera. So otherwise, I'll say goodbye to everyone for now, and we'll see you next month.